Hi, my name is Lara Kudai Sidon Momo, and I want to share with you how I went from having a child at 19, 14 heartbreaks, 15 abortions, a divorce, to being happily married now. And it all started when I was young, you know, I've always loved um, meals and bones, the storytelling, the love conversations. I've always watched movies that ended in happily ever after. Are you like that? Yes, that's who I was. You know, and I grew up believing that life is a fairy tale. I'm gonna meet my knight in shining armor, chiseled abs, it's gonna rescue me, you know, when I'm about to drown and all of that. Wow. Well, all that ended when I was 19 and I fell pregnant. Yeah, I did. I was in a relationship at the time. It was um, about my first relationship. You know, I grew up wanting validation from people that were older than me. I was a firstborn, so I didn't have any older siblings. So I, I met these family friends of mine, boys, and they were like my older brothers. And so here I was at the time, 17, and um, they had introduced a guy to me. And they were telling me, Lara, this guy is good for you. This guy is this, you know, all of those things. And I thought they knew better. I loved them so much. I always wished they were my older brothers, you know. So um, I gave in and I started dating this brother in church we were all in church at the time we were all in the choir at the time you know so um he was seven years older than me i was 17 remember so when we met you know we knew it was wrong to have premarital sex we were in church we knew it was wrong we knew all of those things so we sat down and decided that in seven years time, when I was older, we sat down and calculated it too. We calculated, you know, when you go to school, four years, NYSE, work for one year, <laughs> you know, thinking that that's how it's gonna happen. So that by 24, we will get married. I will be 24, he will be seven, 31, I beg your pardon, at the time. And then we would marry, have kids, and live happily ever after. Until I was 19. And I found myself five months and two weeks pregnant without knowing i had no idea i was just going about my life i was having trickles of period here and there you know i didn't know i know you'll be asking me what do you mean how come you didn't know when you were doing it you didn't know abby hmm. thank you for that question so what had happened was that we graduated from stealing kisses you know smooshing here and there you know to touching and all of that until about one day there was some kind of Ah, no, leave me. No, don't go in. Did you go in? Did you not go in? Did you go in? Did you not go in? And um, the consensus at the end of the day was that, oh, I didn't penetrate, you know, and also me, myself, I didn't see blood, you know, that thing that they teach you, that when you lose your virginity, you see blood on the bed and your hymen is broken. So I didn't see that. So I felt, oh, okay, nothing had happened. And funnily, I had broken up with this brother at about this time because I had entered the polytechnic, the high institution. And um, you know, when you enter an, a higher institution at this time, you begin, that was the first time I was living alone. I was getting to discover myself. And all, so I begin to know that, no, this guy isn't the one for me. He's not, we don't have the same type of dreams. We don't have the same type of goal. You know, so I had broken up with him at this point before I found out that I was five months and two weeks pregnant. Um, I was just finishing my, I just finished my first year in the Polytechnic and just entered my second year. I was the public relations officer at the time of my department. I was the choir coordinator of my fellowship. I was in choir in the city where I was at the time. I was in choir in the church back at home. So it was, it was, I, I thought it was a lie. I actually didn't believe it. I found out on the day of bomb blast, Ikeja bomb blast, January 27th, uh, 2002, you know, and I was, I laughed <laughs> because I'm like, no, <laughs> of course the, the machine must have been faulty. I found out that I was pregnant and all my dreams went like this. I thought that was the end of my life. What was I going to do? I had this dream of becoming this, you know, newscaster on TV, being in the entertainment industry, being in media, 
you know, my dad was so strict. I knew he was going to disown me, everything. You know, my life just went like this, right before my eyes. But thankfully, I don't know where the strength came from. I had begged my mom that I wanted to go back to school. I had one year to finish my ordinary national diploma. And I begged her that I wanted to go back to school without her. You know, my dad wasn't in town at the time. He was on transfer in another city that she should allow me, you know, go to school, let my dad pay my school fees without letting him know, you know, at the time. And um, she agreed reluctantly. So that was how I was able to escape back to school. I went back to school to face you know, criticism from my fellow students, look at you, uh, the self-righteous, all of those things. It was hard, but hey, I scaled through. And do not forget, I had broken up with bro, even though bro was still hanging around thinking, oh, she's going nowhere now. But I was so determined. As the young age of 19, I don't know where the courage came from. I just knew that this is not what I wanted. Remember I talked about my older family friend then, they used to take me to the then um, fountain of life, singles and married. We, we used to go from all the way from Songo Water to Ilupeju every Monday to go listen to Pastor Bimbo Odukoya, who is late now. And there was something she said that guided my life during that period. She said, if you make a mistake by having a child for a man, don't make that same mistake or another mistake by marrying that man because of that child or the children. Marry the man because you love him. So I knew I didn't love this guy. I just gave in to my family and friends at the time because I also wanted to have a boyfriend. You know, so I stood my ground and I wasn't going to be with him. He begged me. I wouldn't even lie. I'm not even here to come and lie on him. He begged me. He wanted to be with me, but I stood my ground and I had my baby in school. You know, I had my baby. It was, it was, it was one of the most crazy experiences of my life. Here I was in school, you know, 19 at the time, raising a baby. I was just a kid. Thankfully, I had my best friend, you know, at the time who had moved in with me. We did the best we could to take care of a child. I'll take the child to the crash, you know, and I'll go to, um, lecture sometimes we didn't even know how to care for the baby sometimes the baby will fall from the bed in the middle of the night that's when i'll be like oh my goodness i had to have a child you know it was it was a roller coaster of emotion but you know what this did to me this made my self-esteem to go down because here i was with my mates you know um without kids but me i had a child I had a kid in school, I couldn't go to all the parties, the jinx carnival, I couldn't, in fact, it affected my studies at the time and I had my first and only carryover because I couldn't really study overnight, you know, and all of that. To top it all, because I was so naive and innocent, I didn't know, because I was in school, my mom only came, you know, every Sunday at a time, just for a period of time and she's gone back. So I was left alone to figure out all these things myself. I developed breast abscess. It's an engorgement of the breast, you know, where one of your breasts or two of your breasts become so big, filled with pores. I was breastfeeding at the time. I didn't know what to do. You know, my dad had heard and sent word when he heard at the time that he didn't want to see me, he didn't want to see the baby, I was no longer his child, you know. But after so much begging, my grandmother, everybody, you know, I was, he allowed me to come home for the break in the semester. And that was when the breast abscess became so much big. I couldn't function. I couldn't wear a bra for months. And you know, my dad, very heartbroken because I was his first child. I finished secondary school when I was, I wasn't even 15 yet. I was almost 15. He used to brag about me. You know, I, I, I was so brilliant. I knew a lot of things. He was so disappointed, so heartbroken, so pained. You know, and he would look at me and be like, man, I thought you were going to be the glory of this family. Your life is finished. Who's going to marry you? Who's going to be with you? Who's going to ever want to be with an after one? And my self-esteem that was already plummeted went further down. And I felt, Lara, this is the end of your life. I became an adult instantly. And started doing a lot of odd jobs 
I started fending for her, looking for, you know, how to pay my own bills, how to pay her bills, how to, you know, pay for her food and all of that. In fact, I remember getting a job as far back, you know, back then with Indians in an Indian company. The money was so mega. All these men wanted to sleep with me, you know, because a uh, uh, young fine girl and all of that. Come here. But I just had this thing for God. I don't know where it came from. I would never, you know, prostitute myself. I just, I, I, I guess it was the values, you know, that was instilled in me or where I was coming from. I, I just couldn't. Me, what I was looking for at the time was love, not money, you know. So I wanted, I wanted to feel loved. I wanted to prove my dad wrong so bad. You know, that if I see any guy that will tell me, you look beautiful, you did this, you did that, you know. And in the beginning, when I was having these relationships, I remember somebody else who counseled me, somebody like an older brother then told me, you know what, when you get into relationships newly, don't tell guys that you have a child, you will scare them away, you know, let them get to love you for a while, then after you start telling them. I tried this for a while. <laughs> oh my goodness. In fact, one of those relationships I had, I dated this guy and then I think it was about the second month or the third, I can't remember. And then I told him, ah, oh my God, there's something I want to tell you. I have a child and you know, all of this, all of this. And then he looked at me and be like, wow, you're such a strong woman. Oh my goodness. You're such a strong woman. Like, I didn't even know if you if you didn't tell me. And you know, he praised me. I was so excited that, oh, he's finally accepting me. And this guy just dropped the bomb on me that, I'm so sorry. I know that at this point, you're looking for a father figure for your child, but I'm sorry, I'm not the person. I, I didn't, I don't have plans <laughs> for you. In fact, you are my fourth girlfriend. I have a girl, I wanna get married. She lives abroad. You know, she went or she went for a master's abroad. I have other girls, but you, I just wanted to have fun with you. So you telling me this, my conscience wouldn't take it to continue. Guy. <laughs> oh my God. This was one of the most painful heartbreaks because, you know, I saw this guy every day. He came to my house every day with his friends. So I remember for years, I kept wondering, where did he get the time? How is he doing other relationships? We went to weddings together. We went out together to places. So where was he, when he was coming from, or when he's coming from work with his friends, three of them, they came to my house every day, you know? But hey, it is what it is, bro. And so I had to let him go. I think after that experience, I told myself, I would not hide this again. I'm tired because that was like the third that I was getting broken after telling. So I'm like, I'm not going to hide this. Anybody who wants to be with me, you know, knowing I have a child should be with me. If they don't want to be with me, let them know or let us all know together from the beginning. And I wasn't going to do that. So from then on, of course, I started telling people, yeah, I mean, I have a daughter. She's this, she's that. Some will be like, <laughs> and then, you know, the interest will die. And, you know, I, I also had one other relationship that it started from friendship. We were in church together, you know, singles at school. And we were very good friends. Both of us, we just got each other. We jailed. And before you know it, we started kissing, you know, we started doing all of those funny stuff. And I, because I liked the guy so much, I thought I was in a relationship already with him. And, you know, I would ask him, what are we doing? Who, he would say, calm down. We're still trying to see where this is going. Let's not put a label to it. Let's not really, you know, let's just, let's not tell anyone. <laughs> Which is why I always tell people, there's a difference between a secret relationship and a private relationship. If you're in a secret relationship, you shouldn't be there. The person has somebody else. The person does not have good plans for you. You can be in a private relationship where the whole world will not know you, but some people, you understand, here and there, that mean uh, a lot to both of you would know about it. So this guy forbade me from telling anyone, even though we're in a close, re neat relationship with our other friends in church, in the singles executive, you know, at the time, and uh, we kept going from, you know, all of those things. I would, <laughs> I had a car. 
<laughs> at this time he didn't have a car i think i just left my job my paid employment so i would go drop him at work in the morning you go to work i'll go pick him in the evening we would probably go somewhere together then maybe go sleep in his house the morning i'll go drop him it was it was just and i thought i i had a boyfriend i was so sure that i was in a relationship until valentine's day you know i wore red went to church waiting for him you know he saw me he was like i'm like okay so what are we doing what's the plan he's like don't worry go home i'm coming to meet you at home we'll go somewhere that's why i sit down bro not come <laughs> you know so other um, important dates maybe december 31st stroke first where in my church at the time lovers usually spend that time together you know pray together you know maybe important days holidays and I expected he us to spend together. He was he wasn't there. Long story short, ladies and gentlemen, I found out that he got married. Yeah, without even a conversation with me, and because I was proving strong, I'm a strong babe. I don't care. This is loss. Is that? I don't, I don't care. I don't do this. You know. I would. We still went to the same church. I didn't, we didn't talk, or I didn't even see him for a long time, but I masked all of the pain. I was okay, I'm good. I was working, I got a job in the bank. I, you know, got a nice house, bought a car, you know, dating different people, yet they keep leaving me one after the other until I had this last relationship. I met him in church. He knew about my daughter. He was, you know, I don't know, we found out that we were birthday mates. <laughs> oh my God, you have no idea. The excitement. He was my speck. Fine guy, handsome. You know, and I'm this godly girl. He was so born again, speaking in tongues. I'm telling you, when, when, when people call him, oh brother, this, this happened, please pray with me. He would pray with them and they come with testimonies. We would pray together and things would happen. You know, we were when we met him, he, he was older than I was. I think I was 28 or 9 at the time. You know, I already had my own company. I just found it. He was so young. You know, he had a job. You know, so we, I thought, man, I had met. In fact, I unveiled him on, on Facebook. There was no Instagram then. Yes, I, un I unveiled him on Facebook as my Prince Charming. And we went out together, had our birthday party, invited. So everybody, a lot of people we were using Blackberry then. People used our pictures. You guys look alike. You guys look good together. Everybody in church knew us. He went to my parents' house, told my dad he wanted to marry me. I, he took me to his house, told them, you know. And so we were already planning to get married, you know, until it did happen. And I fell pregnant again. This, you know, and I thought, hey, we're quickly going to get married, so what's the point? Let's 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 just leave it. I had had 14 had um, abortions at the time, so I was beginning to think, oh my womb, what if I don't have kids anymore? And I told bro, and he was like, never. That is never going to happen. That's not going to be me. I am never marry. I'm never going to marry or walk down the aisle with a pregnant woman. Why? Because he's so respected in church. I was respected in church. I was in a choir. He was gearing up to be a pastor at this time. He was a strong, you know, cell leader, section leader, all those things in our church. So he was going to taint our, taint our image. They were going to suspend us, you know, and call us, you know, in front of everybody and suspend us. And But they would reinstate us after six months. That was the rule of the church. I was okay with that because I'm like, well, by that time, we'd have gotten married, had our baby, and we'll live happily ever after. But he refused. And he came to me 6 a.m. one day. He told me, I have made up my mind. If you want to keep this baby, then go ahead. I'm calling the wedding off. I think that was when my brain was like, what? What do you mean? Why? What do you want? Why would you? Because I didn't want to have two kids outside wedlock. So I gave in. I asked him, what do you want me to do? He said, take away the baby. And then we we'll continue with the wedding plans. I felt okay, and then I went there to do it reluctantly. It was it was it was hurtful. You know why? Because the lady showed me 
the fetus of the baby. It was like, oh, ah, your baby don't they grow? And that image never left my head for a very long time. I aborted the baby, you know, fell into depression. I was so sorry, I was feeling so guilty. And then exactly seven days after, he came and told me, I'm no longer interested in this relationship. Ah, <laughs> I thought it was a joke. You are not what? And I remember getting down on my two knees, begging him, holding his leg. Please don't do this to me. Don't do this. To and he was like, it was so adamant. He, would, he didn't want to, he stopped picking my calls, told me I don't want to see you anymore and all of that. And so I thought to myself, what do I do? What do I do? Everybody knows us together. We've introduced ourselves. We are going to get married. The devil, I remember God. I remember that the devil wants to take this from me. And do you know what I did? I went back to church and fasted for 40 days. Mm. Yeah, I know. You are like, what? Yeah, I did that. I went to church and then, you know, fasted for 40 days. I will put his picture, I will anoint his picture, I will call the names <laughs> that his parents gave him. I will start calling him, calling his head back to, to, you know. And there were periods where I went to this church that we're praying and somebody would come and share testimony that, you know, uh, as I was praying, the Holy Spirit told me to give him praise in the middle of the night, high praise. And I did it naked in the middle of the night. For seven days, a miracle happened. I said, wow, that's another tool. And then I did the same, middle of the night, naked, carrying his picture, dancing. My husband is coming. My husband is coming. <laughs> and before that, he was moving away. When I was doing all of that, I went to his house every day. Because I felt if I was praying, if I was fasting, I needed to fight the good fight of faith. I went to his house every day. He wouldn't talk to me. He was living with his parents, his siblings at the time. So, you know, I was cool with all of them, but he wouldn't talk to me. In fact, as a form of defense, there were times he would bring girls so that, you know, maybe that would chase me away. Me. <laughs> ah, I was in full denial. I never agreed. And, you know, until one day, I guess he was tired, he told me, what do you want? Leave me alone. What do you want? I said, ah, thank you for this question. What I want is that you're going to take me to everybody that you introduced me to, that you were going to marry me. Take me there and tell them you're no longer marrying me. And he's like, you are mad. And I agree because at this time I had lost it. I, I, I was, I didn't know what I was thinking. My mind was somewhere else until he went to our pastor because we had started um, marital counseling, marriage counseling. He went to our pastor and told our pastor, this is what is happening. And then the pastor invited both of us. Our pastor said, I hereby break this relationship in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. That was when full acceptance came into me. And I started my grieving, my mourning, something I ought to have done years ago and then I still go to this same church with this man you know who brought another girl he had one particular seat he was sitting I was a worship leader remember I would be upstage looking at him you know and sometimes I'll forget the lyrics of my music I watched him in six months get married get pregnant you know his wife of course and I would be asking God this is wickedness. This guy, according to Yoruba movies, should be dead or mad by now. Do you know why? Because he also held me to ransom in another way. I founded my company and made him a shareholder. I wanted him to sign out because at the time I thought I was going to marry him. So he was a shareholder and he refused to sign out. So I had to get a lawyer. I was paying a lawyer. It was as if I was going through a divorce. So this was a very, very painful period of my life. Because of the compl some complications that arose from the abortion, I bled for 40 days straight. And I was seeing this man <laughs> in that church, driving. And I would go up stage and minister and sing. I was going crazy. I went from a size 12 to a size 6. I lost myself. I didn't even know who I was. 
you know. But do you know one good thing that happened during that period? It was during that 40 days of fasting. That was when God found me. And he told me, you were never going to marry that man. I'm like, why? What happened? Why wouldn't I marry him? He said, you made him an idol. And two, he was going to disturb his purpose, God's purpose for my life. And what's the purpose? This, this thing I'm doing today. I have told him I wanted to start sharing my story. He refused blatantly and I complied. So when I heard that, I was confused, guys. I won't even lie to you. I was confused. I got the instruction to go and share my story. I thought this was the devil. I want a husband. What nonsense am I hearing? And I did not do that for so long. But after about six months and everything else, the company collapsed. My life collapsed. And I wasn't resting. I wasn't happy. That was when I decided. July 2nd, 2012. I went on Facebook and I started sharing my story. The story of heartbreak, the story of dysfunctionality and all of that. And I'll put the morale. That was where my brand, Lara Kudaisi, started. I did not know. I wanted to just share the story and move away. But I did not know that that was the beginning of my life. That was the beginning of a brand. That was the beginning of my purpose. The beginning of the rest of my life. And I thrived on that for a while. So I started sharing my story, you know, um, putting morale, then people were coming to my DMs, you know, all of those things. And I was, I didn't know what to do in the beginning, but I'll use my head knowledge. It was after a while I felt, okay, I think I should help these people. I think I should get certifications. I started sharing this story more, going to places to share it, you know, writing. I, I had a blog too, wrote in the blog and all of those. Long story short, I made my career out of this. I got a lot of certifications so that I can be empowered to help people, which is why I'm a cognitive behavioral therapist and a family life coach today. But that's not the story. You know, after all of this had happened, I focused on my life, focused on what I was doing. And shortly after, that same year, 2012, I met a man. You know, and I'd always known him anyways. We were also in church together. We were friends, not too deep friends. We used to talk and, you know, so at the time, this is my company. I got an office for it. So I wanted to create more structure, you know. So I'd met him and told him I knew he was out of job. At that time, he had told me, you know, sometimes he leaves his job and take a rest. So he had told me, I told him, please, I'd like for you to come and um, help me put structure in my company because I knew he did admin work and stuff like that. So I wanted to focus on what I was doing. It was a marketing and media company. I was very good at marketing and selling. So I wanted to focus that and I wanted somebody else to be in charge of the admin administrative work. And so at the time I told him in church, he told me to come to his house. Let's discuss, let's talk about it. So because he's my friend, so I'm like, okay. And he told me he will cook for me. <laughs> Which girl does not like a man that will cook for, for her, you know? And um, so I went to his house that day and it was during the talk he cooked and he was asking me, I don't even know how he got into it, but he was asking me, I, I don't know, but I just started sharing my story with him, with this, of this guy, what he did. And he felt so much compassion. I could see, I remember then he touched me, put his hand on my hand and be like, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, you have gone through so much. You know, and I was like, oh, such a kind guy. <laughs> because I wasn't used to men like that. I was used to hard men, you know, who would be like, eh? you two, what did you do? You know, so I saw somebody who, you know, was empathetic at the time. And I remembered also, it was so late. We had, time had taken over. It was so late. I had to sleep over in that house. And I was so afraid because I'd never slept in his house before. You know, um, he had to, his uncle was there. The man, you know, came to meet me. Don't worry, you are fine. They put me in a room. This guy was so kind, so nice. You know, there was no new toothbrush. He went to boil it in salt. You know, one, his own toothbrush. He, he was, I was like, uh -uh, how can somebody be this nice? You know, and he agreed to resume in my office from that day to be a staff and then he told me don't worry about payments i just want to help you you know i see what you've been through i see your passion your this and all of that and then this was how we started working together i didn't know this man had taken a liking to me 
from that very day, <laughs> that very night. Because he told me later that he saw somebody strong, like, what? How can somebody go through all of this and be still be like this, still strong, still forging her head? And ladies and gentlemen, in just about a month of us working together, this man asked me to be his wife. And in my head, I'm like, eh? well, are you joking? What? You know, I didn't have these butterflies or emotional feeling that girls used to feel, you get. But I, I was like, nobody had asked me to marry them in a long time, you know. And this guy is so kind, he's different from the men that I had known, you know, in my life. I saw how kind he was and remember my goal, operation, get married to prove that you're wrong. And so after about two months, you know, I told him I needed to pray, I needed to do this, I needed to do that. And then after about two months, I finally said yes to him. And um, about eight months, I think, yes, after that, we got married. We got married, we were broke, AF. <laughs> why? You know why? Because he wasn't working at the time. He had taken over to help me manage my company. I just knew how to sell. I just knew how to market. I didn't know how to manage a company at the time. And so the company went from earning money to failing in about a year. So the company had collapsed. At this point in time, we were even owing some clients their goods, their payment. It was so messy. And I saw this guy took, you know, I saw him take the fall. I saw him so you know sell his laptop to be able to help me pay my daughter's school fees at the time that I couldn't pay. I saw him, you know, when some people were threatening me with police and all of that, I saw him take the fall. He shielded me. I was a way I I didn't even have to face anything, even though I was in depression, I was always crying, I wanted to end my life and all of that. But so it was during this time that we planned the wedding. We didn't have money. We didn't even have money to get a house. It was that bad. We were both in faith, praying, wishing, you understand, writing, fasting. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. In fact, I remember there was this faith we had. We went to pay. I think the house rent for the house we wanted was about three bedroom. That year was seven hundred thousand, and we went to pay caretaker fifty thousand to deposit it as a sign of faith. <laughs> we didn't have works, but we had faith, you know. And I remember, of course, we didn't have money to complete the, the payment. The caretaker paid us back four times that fifty thousand, and because we didn't have money, we moved in into the house, the uh, mini flat. I got with my younger brother at the time the plan was that I was going to move out to get married then my brother would, so I didn't really buy much things in the house but because we didn't have where we did the wedding ha <laughs> what are you saying we made sure my dad spent a lot on the wedding because I, we wanted to punish haters even me my dress everything the wedding had almost a thousand people I was dancing we were but he was all on debt we didn't have shish at that point in time and so we got married on this premise we were broke we had faith but it was never enough i was an entrepreneur by the way i was i was <laughs> blogging doing relationship coaching on blackberry and facebook I, he wasn't paying a dime he had a job that wasn't in fact i threatened him to get a job and the job was paying next to nothing. He had gotten a loan to get us a house, you know, a bigger house when I got, I got pregnant, by the way, immediately after that, you know, so the burden and then our daughter, my daughter had to come live with us. We had two months, you know, had to feed the baby coming, him, it was, he was so, I was always angry. I was always angry. I was always pressured because I was the one, the owners fell on me to provide. Because, you know, he would be like, he was this, hey, what do you want me to do? I can't really do much. So I would, at a point, I stopped all this coaching thing because I'm like, to hell. I'm not, I'm not doing this. He's not giving me shishi, you know. And I entered the streets when I was seven months pregnant. Started selling land, you know, looking for land to sell. I would trek, you know, long distances in the bush 
that's when ah, <laughs> my Facebook, I would advertise this land, my Blackberry, I would advertise this land, all of these things. And I would get clients. I was making 50K a plot at the time. When land finished, I moved into cars. I, I went to meet a man that was selling cars. Sir, can I sell cars for you? You know, and he was like, ah, why not? You know, I would market cars, I would get a commission. In fact, that was what I was doing till I had our baby. You know, and unfortunately also our baby was ill. We had to spend a lot of money. It was so pressuring. Remember, I didn't actually have that feeling for this man. I just wanted to get married. So I would, I was so aggressive in that marriage. I was so angry. I was so pressured because I literally had to parent my kids and parent this man. Because I, I was literally taking all the decisions. I was the one that everything was on. I was still doing Coach Lara. I was doing this one. I was doing that one. And in such a little time after that, everything just fell. To the, I, I just couldn't deal anymore. It became, it started to get toxic because I was just going crazy. I was, I was a combustion of emo emotions, you know. And I had gotten back to coaching and doing marriage counseling, all of these things. I was speaking in churches, sharing my story and doing all of this. But my own marriage was collapsing. And after a while, I took the bold step to leave that marriage because I knew that the reason, even though we didn't have money, even though things were not happening, but because I really did not like this man or love this man, so, you know, because I didn't love him, I, I saw the, his faults were magnified in my eyes. I was just angry. I was, I, I was so resentful of him. And if we had continued like that, I don't know what, what would have happened. Because anyways, by my book, How the Matchmaker's Marriage Failed, I wrote everything that happened in that marriage. I don't want to spend too much time on that. But hey, we went our separate ways and I had to move. I moved away from Lagos with my two children, went to Abuja. I want to start a new life. Let's start again, let's start again and all of these. In fact, there was one man that I liked at the time. So opportunity, we got together. Ladies and gentlemen, this man broke my heart into so many pieces. Like, I remember that was the, the, the height for me. Because I had thought, you know, leaving a marriage without healing and just getting into a, a, another relationship immediately. I thought that, oh, this man knew better. I liked him. He had all the, the swag and zing that my ex-husband didn't like. But, man, it ended in premium tears. So because I had not mourned my marriage, because I had not grieved my marriage, the fall was great. I tried to commit suicide for the first time in my life. I became, an, uh, I became an alcoholic for one year straight. Nobody knew all of this. You know why? I was still on Instagram posting happy pictures, going hiking, doing stuff. But I would drink so much, I would puke in my room. You know, by morning, I would quickly clean it up before my children come to my room. You know, I was broke. I was struggling. I was messed up. And then one day, I said to myself, Lara... This is not right. This is not a life. What are you doing? What are you doing? You're going to end up dead. You're going to end up somewhere you don't like. What are you doing in this state? What are you doing in this place? You're running away from your problems. Why? Because you want to go and start afresh. Your afresh has jammed your life. And ladies and gentlemen, at that time, at that place, I resolved I am going back to face my pain. I am going back to start my life afresh. I am going back to begin again. I am going back now armed. You know, because I know that running away no, does nothing. Stay and face the pain. I came back to Lagos with my kids. You know, both of them started you know, different schools at the time. And I remember that was when I wrote my book, How the Matchmaker's Marriage Failed. In fact, that was when I went to therapy all over. I'm a therapist, don't forget. I went to therapy all over. I had somebody, I had a coach who was helping me. I had a senior therapist who was helping me, you know, until I came back to find my feet and find myself. 
I started my life and decided to stay single because I had, re I had, I had discovered that I had something called relationship addiction. That was when I understood that the root of my problem was trying to prove my dad wrong. And I said, no more. No more proving nobody wrong. Lara, be single. Stay on your own. Heal yourself. Focus on your life. Build a game. And of course, yeah, you want to get married. That will come. But right now, sit down. And I started, I used three years, three solid years to stay single. And I was, you know, people, don't get me wrong, girl. I had people coming. <laughs> I had men, but I knew that I wasn't ready. I wanted to, there was something that was making me be this way. I needed to purge myself of that thing. And I knew I needed time, you know, to get to, to, to make sure I get it right this time. And by the time I was ready in three years, I knew I was ready. Why? Because I no longer felt hurt. I no longer felt controlled by the previous relationships, by the previous pain. I no longer had a lump in my chest. I no longer, you know, felt condemned, you are finished. You know, I, I, I stopped having all of those, those feelings and I had built my self-confidence and self-identity back. And then I said I was ready. Mulara, could I say? It's your time. And what did I do? I wanted somebody different because I had sat down, I had highlighted all the people I had been with. I saw, the, I saw where it went wrong. I saw that I had a low self-esteem because I had had a child. So I always made it look as if anybody that wanted to be with me was doing me a favor. I would bend beyond and double to please them. I said, no more. Lara, you are valuable. Who are you? What is your name? What did God call you? What do you call yourself? And I started to, you know, understand who I am. I realized that I am not, a, <laughs> my pain was my past. I realized that it was a stepping stone for me. I realized that I had a gift, which was to use my pain to help to heal people. I realized that I am powerful. Why? Because I had a before. <laughs> I had a now and I needed to have an after. So, I started visualizing. I want a man, an alpha male. Why? Because I am this strong alpha female. You know, you've been following my journey. You know that my drive was times three my age. My life, my thoughts, my it was a lot. So I said I needed an alpha male. I needed somebody who could, you know, handle me. One, two. I needed somebody who has a child before because i already had two children i needed him to be and not just two children i had a grown-up at the time i think she was about 19 or so or 18. so i needed somebody that can parent my two children i needed a good role model for my child i wanted somebody i would also feel emotionally connected with that was very important with, for me but i also needed him to have his head on his shoulders you know I knew that because I had dated a lot of men, all these men, all these men that would, you know, let's go have fun, he drinks, he smokes, you know, he just likes to relax, all those things. I saw that they didn't really have substance. I looked at myself, Lara, what kind of man do you want? What kind of man can match the new life that you have now? I needed a man that has strong value system. I needed a man that does not believe that, you know, cheating is normal. Because for me, that's out of it. I needed a man that would help me build a role model marriage that I want for my life and for my children. So I didn't settle. I had men. Guys, I'm not saying this to brag to you. I had men, good men. I had a man travel from Australia to come and see me in Nigeria twice. I had another one come from the UK. But I, I saw this ones. I knew that no, not this. <laughs> not this ones. people who just took life as it come people who weren't intentional about their lives people who were they, they excuse things easily mm -mm. i knew that wasn't going to work for me i knew the kind of life i want that's why you have to know yourself you have to know your identity so that you don't come and cry later what do you want you who are you but by the time you find who you are then you can find who matches that state of identity that was what happened to me I found myself I am not one 
you know, simple not to crack. I am a very deep person. I am, I had a lot of trauma. Even though I was healing, I had healed. I needed somebody who had a large capacity to handle this. Not somebody who breaks easily when I scream from my trauma. You know, I needed that person. And I was visualizing day and night. Day and night. Because I also know about visualization. I know about the power of positive thinking. I know about the power of literally creating my life. I had learned all of these things from my, you know, courses and all of that. Of course, I'm a therapist. So I would, before I sleep every night, I would visualize that I am with my husband in a very serene place at the beach, you know, having a picnic or maybe I'm, I'm running, he's chasing me, you know, those Nigerian movie things. I would picture us with our children together. I would picture me speaking at a large event and my husband led me to that venue. I would picture us sitting together in front of the camera sharing our story. I will picture us in a church, you know, both of us, you know, helping a lot of marriage, marriages. And men started coming until I met a man. <laughs> I met a man by accident, you know. Do you know why I said it was an accident? Because I had gone to an award ceremony, you know, and met a, 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 a man there. And he took a liking to me immediately. He took all my, he was a very popular person. He took my pictures at the awards. He was nice to me. In fact, I remember he had a VIP, um, a VIP ticket. I had a regular ticket. Because he, of our connection, he made sure he took me to the place, upgraded my ticket to VIP so that we could sit together. He took my number. He was quite a company for me that day. You know, and I was like, hmm. But one thing that disqualified me for, for, that disqualified him for me on the spot was that, you know, he was taking my pictures, we were on the red carpet, and then somebody approached me, because I dressed, I was, I dressed so beautiful that day. Somebody approached me, I was like, oh, my please, you look so cute, can I take your picture? And then the man turned on me like, huh, huh. You know, he, give, he gave me one look, and he was like, what is this, what is this? And of course, I took, you know, the guy took the picture with me. That was when I knew that he, this, this is not the man. You know why? Because I know I'm going to be big. I'm going to be a superstar. I'm going to have people, you know, that want to take pictures with me, that will want to, you know, see me. I didn't need somebody that would be jealous. I didn't need somebody that would stop that shine. And I knew on the spot, you can know these things if you are attentive. You can but you overlook them. You'll be like, hey, it's because he likes me. It's because he's jealous. <laughs> I knew that night. And so long story short, he had called me, you know, he wanted to meet with me. I didn't want to go because I already knew there was no way there. But then while we were discussing on the phone, I told him that I just got back to Lagos. I had a radio show in Abuja and I needed somebody to, um, um, I needed a radio show. So I want, I don't know how, you know, how to get back on radio and he said oh he works on radio but he also has a friend who has a radio show and so um he would want me to come to meet him at that radio station and then he would now see maybe that my friend can allow me co-host with him till i would have my own show and so that was why i went to meet him that day at the radio show and by the time it was a studio they were already on air and I, it was it was night. It was about 9, 10 p.m. And by the time I got upstairs to the studios, I think they went on break. This man, it was about five guys on the console. And this man <laughs> stood up and came to meet me, hugged me from the front, hugged me from the back, and pecked my neck, trying to claim ownership. That was the second time I was seeing him. That disgusted me to my stomach. <laughs> like... I don't want that much PDA because I don't even like you. And then two, we've not even got into that level. But I smiled through it. I'm, I'm like that. I smiled. You know, he did that so that he would show the other guys in the studio that this is mine. Don't go near her. You know, and um, I was looking at them. So he, he signaled to me to wait till they finish so that I could talk to his friend. And while they were trying to close the show, the friend who was the main um, presenter said, 
Oh, ladies and gentlemen, it's been a pleasure riding with you. There's this young lady that walked in and the atmosphere changed, the smell in the room changed. You know, when a lady enters, you know, everything changes. And he's like, oh, please, would you step up to the mic? I'm like, oh my goodness. Would you step up to the mic and introduce yourself? And I'm like, my name is Larkada. I said, the other man was like, she's the matchmaking mistress. He was so excited. And, you know, these guys started engaging me like, oh, really? You're the matchmaking mistress. Oh, my goodness. I'm the hookup master. Oh, my God. Are you going to hook me up? And then we had that banter on radio. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> I knew <laughs> that there is something. I felt that connection in that conversation. That I, I, like, this man is, uh, you know. And then we finished and everybody went downstairs. Then the person I came to see was like, oh, uh, Lara, where do you live? Because he didn't know where I lived. I told him this place it had happened or it happened to be that that presenter lived exactly where i lived and so this man said oh bro could you drop her for me that was the mistake of his life oh, ladies and gentlemen that's how i entered the car of this man and we had so much to share. We had so much connection. We saw that we had a lot of things alike. You know, he had told me how, you know, of course, I think I knew him when we started talking, that he was married to um, a very popular singer, musician, you know, who died. So I'm like, I think this is the guy. I think this is the guy. I wasn't sure, but of course he confirmed it to me, told me about that. And you know me, I was telling him, it's okay, you know. He was like, wow, you're the only person who understands. Everybody just says, move on. Everybody just says this. Everybody just says, we shared a lot of things. He wanted, you know, he wanted to write a book or he had written a book. I was like, oh, why don't you do this? Why? I, we shared a lot of ideas. We didn't know that. I think from about 10, 30 or 11 p.m. By the time we were... We just heard somebody knock. I was in the, his car. Somebody knock on his car window. It was our uh, the gate man for the estate. And he said, bros, it's midnight. And I checked the time. It was 2 a.m. And the man said, bros, if you want to go, go. If you want to go inside, go inside. You cannot stay here. You know, that was when we were like, oh my God, it's 2 a.m. Oh my goodness. Oh, talk to you later. See you. You know, and I knew that, I knew. In fact, I remember telling one of my friends that something happened today. I, I don't know, I feel this connection with this person. And it was like, uh, be coming down. And you know why I could say that? Because I was already visualizing. I was already praying. I was already, you know, I was expecting. You have to expect what you are praying for. So I knew that any man I met was a potential because that was what I was already praying for. That was what I was visualizing. And so this man did not start anything with me because he, of course, he thought I was with his friend. So that conversation didn't come up. But then a month after, I got the idea to start a program, you know, called How They Healed. And I wanted him to share his friend too and a lot of other people. I told him about it. He was so intrigued, helped me with the planning, helped me with the publicity. He was everywhere with me you know and long story short in like three months of meeting you know this man asked me to be his girlfriend and um i had already liked him so it was a no-brainer you know we had had so much connection we had talked a lot about you know his plans i had gotten to know him i see that i've seen that he's intense because I, I discovered that i'm a very intense lover i love as if my life depends on it so having discovered this it stopped me from i don't date because i know that not many people can handle that meeting this guy <laughs> i knew that it was like me he shared how he was with his wife that died how he loved her how he couldn't move on about seven years after how this how that so i knew that oh and then i asked about his life you know he doesn't drink doesn't smoke very godly very christianly had good moral values you know had had a child too and I knew that huh, this is the kind of person I like. I also saw that our purpose complemented each other. You know, he, he, he knows how he's in media, so he directs, you know, me, I shoot videos. So we did a lot of those things together. So I'm like, I think I like this guy. And so we began dating. And uh, for a while, it was good until it was no longer good because he would just, I think when he became serious and he woke up one day, I'm like, 
Because we're already talking marriage. From the first, he's not somebody to beat around the bush. He didn't just say, let me check. Mm -mm. He would tell me, what are your marital plans? So we knew that we were always talking about marriage, talking about goals. But all of a sudden, he would disappear on me. And I'll be like, what's going on? What's happening? What happened? What's going on? And he, he wasn't picking my call from, for one week. I remember that period. I would call him and call him and call him. I was sending messages until one day I went to see him in his house. You know, and when I saw him and asked him, why don't you pick my calls, what's going on? He started, he just looked at me and started crying. And he was able to tell me that he's just afraid. You know, what if you die? What if you do this? What if this happens to him again? Then, you know, a lot of things that he shared with me naturally a normal girl will be like ah, i beg i beg i beg i beg i can't deal with this one no. so you're not ready i'm too i don't be caretaker but i knew maybe because i was a therapist you know and a coach i knew that this guy needed help and though i'm a therapist i'm not the person to help him and i started suggesting therapy to him i started suggesting therapy to him and i was so glad because he was so interested you know some men will be like what's that i cannot be he's not like that you know, he would go, I would tell him, do this one, he would go, he would go, he would go. You know, he would, at a point, we became friends, even though we were no longer dating, we were just friends. And, but we didn't stop seeing each other. The, our connection is so strong that even though we were not dating, he, I would be the first person he would call when something happens. He would be the first person I would call. And I had a conviction in my spirit because I had prayed about him. And God told me, that's your husband. You're supposed to nurture him back to life. God did tell me that. You know, so I knew this, you know, even though it was painful, that it wasn't happening as fast as I wanted it to happen. You know, I had to learn how to sit back. I was used to controlling things. So I had already had the wedding planned in my head. In fact, that was what made us break up because I was putting pressure on him. I had already planned it. You know, it was 2020, that year, this pandemic, let's just have wedding 10 people 20 people you know and he was like i'm not ready i'm not ready i'm not ready and i'm like then you are not ready you are not there you are not committing and you're not you are you are standing you are holding my life to ransom <laughs> because i had planned everything i was going to write a book about it i was going to launch my comeback i was going to do this i was going to do that and i was using as an alpha woman that i am i was using that on him and because he's also an alpha male he just told me one day you know what? I don't want to be an obstacle to your life. I don't want to be the one holding you down. Please move ahead with your life. I don't want to be a part of that. So that was when my eye opened. I was like, Lara, you're a woman. Learn to stand back. Learn to follow. He's the man in a relationship. A man has to lead or needs to lead. You get? So that was when I, I started learning how to follow how to follow his pace, you know, and he went through therapy, lots of them, lots of those courses, you know, I'm so grateful, so grateful to God that he's that kind of man, you know, he's that kind of man that is interested in self-development and bettering himself and healing from all that pain, you know, it took us three years and just a few months, yes, of starting this journey till he just told me that day let's marry now you know let's just do this thing and i'm like oh that's true let's get married though something small maybe we don't need to make noise so lara you know i know you now i don't need to bring it i'm like oh why not you know and from that day that we made that decision six weeks after that day we got married traditionally in my father's compound with so much joy and excitement and today, I want to tell you guys that I'm not here to come and tell you, oh, I'm living like a villa Luca. Every marriage, of course, has its issues. No marriage is perfect. But because I have been married twice, this marriage, at least right now, fulfills me and helps to helps to, to uh, 
This is quite emotional for me. I'm serious. But I don't, I don't, I don't know why. It, I don't always like getting emotional, you know. Because it's a confirmation that God can put together broken pieces and make it whole. I cannot believe that me, that used to feel useless, me, that was left to the fate of men before I can be happy, before I can smile, this same me today help thousands of people. This same me has a man, you know, who adores the ground that I walk on. And I feel the same way, you know, about him. So I didn't share this story just so that, hey, I just, I just want to talk. I want you to know that truly you can be happy again. I want you to know that truly, if you can follow the process, if you can stop struggling with yourself, if you can stop living as if you know everything, you've been through the worst, the motions, all men are crazy. <laughs> all men cheat men, Nigerian men, forget it. All men are this. This is what they want. They just want to sleep with you and move you and move away. If you can humble yourself enough, to learn and work to change your mindset. I promise you that you'll be happier again. And I always say every time before I leave that it is never too late to start over. I am a testimonial of this line. Bye for now.